Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to start out by presenting a hypothetical. Suppose that you were an aircraft designer in 1944-45, and you were a member of one of the major powers in World War II. You're doing your job making conventional planes and whatnot, when one day your superiors come to you with a new request. They want you to design the smallest fighter aircraft that you can come up with. Now, there are certainly a lot of different directions you could go. You could find ways to shorten the wingspan, shorten the tail, reduce the cockpit size, etc. However, do keep in mind that the request was just for the smallest possible fighter, and you don't actually have to factor in safety, or solid control, or anything like that. With that in mind, the smallest possible fighter that I could think of basically would be like the scene in Dr. Strangelove where the guy rides the bomb. You take out the explosives, put in a jet or rocket thruster, give it a bit of fuel, a gun in the nose, and I don't know, maybe some handles for the pilot to hold on. And ta-da, you've got a really tiny fighter. Of course, while this kind of design would objectively be hilarious, such a design wouldn't be a viable aircraft, and if you presented it to your superiors, it would quickly get rejected. Your design would basically be a missile with a gun on it, a quasi-kamikaze plane. So after you present your first design, they decide to clarify a bit. Your tiny fighter has to have an actual cockpit, the ability to land and be reused, and, most critically, it has to be a bomber interceptor. With these new stipulations, especially that last one, it makes things much more difficult, especially for a small fighter. Now, the idea of making these teeny tiny microfighters, or just small military aircraft in general, certainly isn't a new one, and in a pinch they can be quite useful. Because of their size, or lack thereof, small fighters are much more resource efficient, requiring far less materials than your typical aircraft, and because it uses less material, and thus is likely much, much lighter, you can use lower power engines in the design. You can save the strong engines for other, better aircraft and you can use unwanted and sometimes outdated engines for this smaller one. For example, some American projects and proposals, like the Bell XP-77 and Douglas XP-48, use these small inline engines with under 800 horsepower, engines that were far too underpowered to see use on more typical frontline fighters. However, at the same time, these microfighters are generally pretty limited in what they could do, in that they would basically just be short-range emergency interceptors, and that's it. Their small frames and underpowered engines also meant that they wouldn't carry all that much fuel, nor would they have a substantial armament for the same reason. They wouldn't really have any other utility as a light bomber or a high-altitude interceptor or anything of that nature. Just your standard low- and mid-altitude interceptor to take out enemy fighters. So what if you wanted to make one of these microfighters that could actually perform at high altitudes? Well, you would probably do something like what Germany did and you would try to make a parasite aircraft. This is probably the smallest fighter design of World War II, or at the very least, I'm not aware of one that was smaller than this, and it was intended to destroy Allied bombers and save German cities. This is the Arado E-381 Kleinstjäger, which translates literally to small or miniature fighter. Now, just as the concept of a microfighter isn't exactly unique, neither is the idea of a parasite aircraft. Much like an actual parasite where a much smaller entity attaches itself to the much larger entity for some kind of benefit, parasite aircraft are small aircraft connected to a large aircraft, 
and then at some point in flight, they release from the larger aircraft and then fly under their own power. This format is often utilized to give the parasite craft much greater range than it would have otherwise, with the parent plane naturally having significantly more fuel and thus greater range. The parent plane is typically a twin-engine bomber at the very minimum, but the larger the better. When it comes to parasite aircraft, probably the most well-known and arguably most successful is Japan's Yokosuka MXY-7 Oka, a kamikaze plane in what was effectively a missile with a squishy human center that was attached to a Mitsubishi G4M twin-engine bomber. Some other notable examples include the XF-85 Goblin, a fighter attached to a Convair B-36. There was also an F-84 Thunderjet that was attached to a B-36. There was also Project TomTom, -Tom, a different version of the F-84 B-36 combo package, where two F-84s and a single B-36 were attached at the wingtips. And there was also an example all the way back in 1916, where a small biplane was connected to a large seaplane. Now, for the general problems with parasite aircraft, we'll get to that later. But the point for now is that parasite planes weren't a unique concept, and were tested before and after World War II to extend the range of small aircraft. But at one point late in World War II, a lot of parasite aircraft designs were put on German drawing boards out of panic and desperation, in an effort to halt Allied bombing of German cities. In July 1944, the Luftwaffe began what was known as the Emergency Fighter Program. By that time, the war situation had degraded for Germany to the point where Allied bombers overhead were a near-constant threat that they could do rather little to stop. While they still had some solid fighters, like the BF-109 and FW-190, they didn't perform all that well at high altitude, and thus would struggle against attacking bombers and their escorts. This then led to the Emergency Fighter Program, where aircraft companies were to design these short-range interceptors that could rapidly climb to high altitudes to attack these enemy bombers. These emergency aircraft were to largely use rocket or jet propulsion, that gave them much greater climb rates and potential top speeds. All manner of designs and concepts were proposed, from very simple gliders that went against the program's general concept, to jet-powered ramming aircraft that had metal-reinforced wings and noses. Our subject for today, the E-381, was largely your average design from this program, but had the difference and distinction of being really, really, really small. For the emergency program, the company Arado would propose a rocket plane attached to a jet bomber. Arado, despite being a smaller company that largely produced single-engine prop planes and other designs that were contracted out to them, they would have a multitude of bizarre designs during the war, and they would also have the distinction of having one of, if not the first jet bomber in the world, with the AR-234. First flown back in June 1943, the AR-234 was a slender reconnaissance aircraft and bomber that would either utilize two underwing Junkers Yumo-4 turbojet engines in the 234B model or it would have four underwing BMW-3 turbojet engines in the 234C model. These models could optionally be fit with rocket thrusters that would assist in the takeoff, as early jet engines were pretty finicky. The 234 was outfit with tricycle landing gear with rather stubby little legs that meant that it sat very close to the ground. As early jet engines used a lot of fuel, in relation to how much power they provided, 
a 234 slender frame was largely dedicated to fuel storage, which meant that the outfitted bomb payload would have to be external, not internal. Also, because of its jet engines, the 234 was one of the fastest bombers in existence at the time, able to consistently hit speeds over 400 miles an hour. Ideally, the 234 was to eventually reach production levels of several hundred per month. But as the war progressed, and resources, manpower, and production facilities grew ever more scarce, production levels would never even come close to that, and just over 200 234s were made in total. But in mid to late 1944, with the pipe dream of 234 mass production still a possibility, a very distant possibility, sure, but possible nonetheless, Arado would throw their hat into the emergency fighter program with the E-381, which was basically a rocket with wings and a man crammed inside of it. Now, while the data for the size of the 381 seems to be a little confused in that the sources I found list three different variants, and which variant is which, which one came first, seems to be a bit, uh, fluid, but at its absolute largest, the 381 design would measure in at a colossal 5.54 meters long, 5.05 meters wide, and 1.51 meters tall. At its smallest, the 381 would measure in at 4.69 meters long, 4.43 meters wide, and 1.29 meters tall. Even at its absolute largest, the 381 was still smaller overall than something like the XF-85 Goblin, one of the smallest fighter designs ever made. The 381 would be powered by a single Walter HWK-109-509 rocket, firing from the lower rear of the fuselage. With small square wings and a twin fin tail, it would be controlled by a single pilot lying within, laying down in the prone position, both to ensure that the 381 could fit underneath the AR-234 and its stubby legs while it was on the ground, and to also make it so that it was harder to hit while it was in the air, the 381 would have an incredibly narrow fuselage, which then necessitated the pilot laying prone. This would also have the added benefit of allowing the 381 to perform more strenuous maneuvers with higher G-forces, as pilots can withstand higher Gs while lying prone. To ensure both the survival of the pilot and the plane itself, the 381 would actually be decently armored, at least as emergency planes are concerned. The cockpit glass was to be 14 centimeter thick plexiglass. The entrance panel above the pilot was 20 millimeter thick metal plating and around the back half of the fuselage to protect the rocket and its fuel, 5 mm thick steel plating was added. But likely in an effort to save weight and space, the 381 would also have no traditional landing gear, and instead a retractable little skid was on the underside, and a deployable parachute was located just in front of the tail. Presumably, either the parachute could be used like a drag racer uses one to slow the plane down after touchdown, or in a pinch, the parachute could be deployed early, and the 381 could just gently float back down to Earth. For the plane's offensive capabilities, the 381 was overall lightly armed, inevitably so due to its small size, and just above the fuselage and pilot, would be a single MK-108 30mm cannon with 45 rounds. On one of the versions, the cannon was removed in favor of six small rockets, resting within the wing and upper fuselage. Additionally, on one of the versions, two small bumps could be seen on either side, just behind the cockpit glass. This was for some added room for the pilot, 
so he could bend his elbows and move properly. Even with these bumps, though, the frontal area of the 381 was incredibly small, at just under half a square meter in total. Compare that to almost two square meters for something like the BF-109. This basically meant that the 381 from the front was less than a quarter of the size and a quarter of the target over a more conventional aircraft. Combined with a total wing area between five and five and a half square meters, the 381 was just an incredibly small target. Being so small, the gross weight sat just above 2,600 pounds, and also the top speed sat at 560 miles an hour. However, with its very small fuel stores, the range was only about 62 miles. So, how exactly would a completed mission with this microfighter work? On the ground, with the 381 likely resting on some kind of wheeled cart, the pilot would enter through the armored hatch. On two of the proposed versions, the entrance hatch was on the top of the fuselage, which meant that the hatch could not be used when the 381 was connected to the parent plane. Basically, when the 381 was connected, the pilot inside was stuck until further notice. On the third proposed variant, the hatch was more to the side, so the pilot could enter and exit while attached. After attaching to the AR-234 parent aircraft, the 234 would take off towards the incoming enemy bombers, and would climb to an altitude around 3,300 feet above whatever the enemy bombers were at. Then, once within some kind of estimated range, I would assume within 10 miles or so, the 381 would be released, and it would both glide and rocket towards its target. There was enough fuel on board for a couple attacks, probably two, so the 381 could scream towards its target, fire, and come back around for one more pass. Once the fuel was expended, the 381 would glide back down to Earth, and on approach, a set of retractable skids would be deployed, and the parachute would be deployed as well. The 381 could then be refueled, rearmed, and the process would begin anew. At least that was the idea of how this would go, but in reality, the 381 would never have a functional prototype made, and at best, a handful of unmanned glide testing frames were made. There were also apparently several wooden frames that were made to give some prospective pilots of these things some experience inside a prone position cockpit, but that was about it. The 381 advanced no further than this for two major reasons. One was just a general lack of interest from the Reich Air Ministry, who funneled much more time and money into projects like the BA-349 Natter, a project that I think might actually be inferior, but what do I know? The second major reason was a lack of the AR-234 parent planes. For one, the production of the 234 would never reach the desired several hundred per month, and just over 200 were made in total. For two, the 234 variant that would use the 381 was specifically to be the C variant, the one that had four total engines. And if there weren't that many 234s in total, there were even less of the C variant. Simply put, there just weren't enough of these parent planes for the 381, and without those parent planes, the 381 couldn't be used. Now, Germany did have a lot more conventional propeller-powered bombers at their disposal, but there's a major problem with parasite aircraft as a whole, in that they often significantly reduce the performance of the parent plane. On the 234, this would have been less of a problem, since it carried its normal payload externally anyway. But on more standard bombers that carry their payloads internally, having what was a second plane on the outside of it 
with all of the added weight and additional drag, would significantly reduce performance and made the parent aircraft much more of a sitting duck. This was actually one of the bigger problems with Japan's Oka parasite planes. They made their parent aircraft much bigger and easier targets, and a good number of the Okas were destroyed before they could even launch from the parent planes. So could Germany have attached the 381 to more conventional bombers like the Ju-88, for example? Sure, they could have, but would it have been smart? No. But even if, hypothetically, Germany had enough parent aircraft for the 381, they probably wouldn't have been terribly effective anyway. They were just so small, and with just a single 30 mil gun with 45 rounds, the destructive potential of an individual 381 was incredibly low. Each plane could only make a couple attacks per flight, and unless they were very lucky or a very good shot, they probably wouldn't be able to destroy an enemy bomber with just one of them. It would likely take several 381s to take out a single bomber, and then they would also have to contend with enemy escort fighters and bomber defensive weapons and whatnot. While the small size of the 381 would make it hard to hit, and it did have some armor, still a short burst from a P-51 Mustang would probably still obliterate the 381. This is all to say that even if Germany had the resources to make both the 381 and the AR-234 parent aircraft in droves, they probably would have been better off producing larger aircraft that have more individual destructive potential. While parasite aircraft are an enticing idea, there's a reason why the concept hasn't been terribly successful. It's ultimately kind of a waste to need two aircraft to make one good aircraft. So even though the 381-234 combo may have been one of the better parasite plane combinations, at least in theory, not making it was ultimately the best decision. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. For something completely different, I started playing Borderlands 2 again, since they just announced Borderlands 4, and I'm both excited and afraid of what Borderlands 4 is going to be. The gameplay in Borderlands 3 was really, really good, probably the best in the series, but the writing and characters were terrible, so I'm almost afraid to see how much worse the characters get. Now, I could rant about this for a while, so instead, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!